start off with, we'll give African American teachers in the second grade to every student so that we early on have the students having African American teachers. That's, that was part of it. And at Peterstown High School, they actually had an African American teacher who taught geography and Kenya. But what I found out in talking with, with uh, Marty Cole, anybody know Marty Cole from Malden? Yeah. Marty Cole, Teacher of the Year, 1980. Uh, she's now, she will be 90 years old on Juneteenth. And her birthday, if you haven't gotten an invitation, just come on out to Malden on Sunday the 17th and we'll party. But she and her sister uh, uh, were both school teachers. And they talked to me about at Charleston High School and how they did it. What they did is, and I apologize, I think the coach's name is in here. I can't remember the coach, I think it was, was from Garnet. But what they wanted to do is to bring four really strong teachers from Garnet to Charleston High School and integrate the, the kids, uh, the, the students, in. And I'm, I, they said that the coach, Jerry, the coach, and another, maybe a vice principal or something, you know, would meet every morning and talk about what's going on. What do you hear? Well, now Johnny Smith was down at the drugstore, and he was talking to Susie, and they were, you know, got a little hot, and so they would take care of it. And so there was there was a very conscious effort by folks to make sure that Kanawha County integrated in an appropriate way. And that story's not exactly told. Mose Newsom's wife was the English teacher who came over, and you know he is Mose Newsom is who Leon, Leon Sullivan in his book Moving Mountains gives credit for his development and and, and his commitment to, to helping people. Cole sisters say that she's probably the best English teacher they ever had, <laughs> and she was just wonderful. And so that's how people did. But that's what this, this, this little booklet's about, and, and, and I don't know if you got them, but feel free to read those and pass them on. And I'll give you all a few minutes to um, And I brought some books. <laughs> Does everybody know about Up From Slavery? I mean, we, uh, Up From Slavery, Booker T. Washington's book. Have you read it recently? It changed. I, I haven't read it. I should have read it for the, tonight, but I haven't read it recently myself. So many people say, I read it. Yes, I read it in middle school. I read it, you know, and it was really interesting. Uh, it changes as you get older. It's one of those books. Read it now, and I think you'll have a different view of it. Uh, its first chapter is about Malden. I don't have uh, I just recommend, and it's in every bookstore in America. I mean, these are at about four bucks. You know. Read this book; you won't put it down. And then I, ha I had to bring in Richard Andres. This is volume two. Uh, volume one is really the entire top. Incredible book, just incredible. Put on image one. Um, <coughs> brought in this book on Team Cole just again because of the uh, uh, Patrick McCoy and. When you look at the pictures and you realize how, how people live, what was happening in Williamson wasn't over a pig. It was over timber rocks. And if you think it was over a pig, then you can romance that story to death. It was over timber rights, and you had two timber barons who were able to function because they were in different states. And they were so politically powerful that they could control the governors, the sheriffs, and everybody else. And it was, it was a wilderness frontier kind of economy and time. And they're, they're doing that, and in Fayette County, they're doing it out of air. You say, well, but they're not having feuds and things. Right, but, but you really have the same kind of economic development going on in the southern part. And you remember in Hatfields and McCoy's, they say, well, the railroad's coming. Kind of and the devil Ant says, well, the railroad's coming through, and then when it comes through, we can really ship our timber out. And that's what they were waiting on. Well, the story is basically before the railroad gets there. But, but in Barrie, in the river, the railroad came through, and that's the first, and then all the railroads developed after that. So anyway, let me give you a few minutes, and I'll be back and we'll talk about all of it. Not No, yeah, yeah, this is the, this is the short subject part. <laughs> all right, let's get going. My name is Larry Rowe. I'm an attorney in my office. Uh, my home is uh, in Malden, West Virginia. Malden is really the historic settlement of the Kanawha Valley. Uh, its, its history really is our history, uh, at least through into the, to the beginning of the, of the 20th century. Uh, I, 
there were several things that I tried to discover as, as, as I went through why, where the name Mall came from. Uh, where did Booker, where was Booker's cabin actually located? Uh, and I was there for 15 years before we figured it out. And the reason we were able to was uh, Ray Lewis, who's here with us today, got us maps of the, uh, got us road maps, and old uh, uh, maps that show the railroads when they came through and they show the location of the, the Booker's cabin. Anybody know where it is? We don't have it marked, and there's a reason, because we, we may be intruding on United States government property. If you were in Malden, and you decided you wanted to drive to Bell on the four lane, and you come out of, out of Malden, and you turn and go up the ramp to Bell, that's the site of the cabin. The cabin, the cabin site was, had a border with the old Episcopalian church, St. Luke's, that just sort of fell down. The Shrewsbury's built it. It didn't stay up very long, for about 15 years, and then it fell down just right before the Civil War. But that, that is where the, the property was in the middle of Malden. The name Malden, uh, I was given a, a, a newspaper article on a homecoming, and I can't even remember, can't give you the date right now, but it, it's about 1913, a homecoming. And a newspaper article said very simply that a man named Hewitt came from Malden, Massachusetts, and brought the name with him. You say, well, that wouldn't, that doesn't really authenticate it, does it? There's no other document that I've seen that even refers to where the name comes from. You all might know that it originally was called the Lex, that's trying, the Buffalo Lex, because at Campbell's Creek there was an outcropping on, on the surface of salt. And the, the first European person to come through the Pinal Valley would have been in 1755, Mary Draper Ingalls, who was captured by Native Americans in with today's Blacksburg, and taken to because she knew how to make salt, and in fact made salt in Malden, so she's our first salt maker. How do we know? Well, her great grandson was John P. Hale, who was mayor of Charleston, put the Brick Street in on Summer Street, built the hotel to encourage the legislature to move the capital here. Uh, uh, Hale House, it burned to the ground in the Ruffner Hotel. Everybody remember the old Ruffner Hotel? Now, it was gone by the time I came to Charleston. But truly, if the song, we, uh, let me see, help me with the song. We, we tore it down to put up a parking lot. And, 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 it's, uh, and, and we definitely tore it down and put up a parking lot on that site, right at the, at the bridge. Hale House was on the same location. Dr. Hale's home was on the uh, Today's Canal Boulevard, right there next to across across Hale Street, uh, and he his house you may know in Malden, uh, one of his original homes when he was a salt maker uh, was is the Hale House where Cabin Creek Quilts was. They, they do a brick house there, and, and today across the street is a park that's dedicated to to uh, Booker T. Washington and his assistant and his sister Amanda Johnson, who lived there, and her home was there. Uh, she lived there from 1880 uh, on until she died in 19, I'm going to say 1915. Uh, she died right before Booker did. But um, uh, Dr. Hale lived in Malden. He was a salt maker. He lost his fortune in salt and uh, uh, made other fortunes in having the railroad hotel. And anybody know why the railroad hotel was straight across from the, today's train station? You could guess when in 1873 when the CNO Railroad came through, they needed a train station in Malden, and it was on the other side of the river. So you had to have a ferry to get across. The South Side Bridge and, the, its, and its predecessor were built for the purpose of getting passengers and other folks to and from the train depot. So what else about Malden? There's a, a, a little church there called the African Zion Baptist Church. I contend that that, is the great, that that is the greatest icon of the success of Reconstruction era after the Civil War. So, whoa, that's a pretty heavy statement. I think it can be supported, and I intend to, to, to do that with you tonight because of its importance. There's also behind the, 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 the church, which sits next to the fast check. It's not a very glamorous location, folks. My law office is on one end and the church is on the other of the fast check parking lot. And behind the church is a reconstructed cabin 
to, to give us a sense of what Booker's cabin was like in the 1870s and 80s. Uh, the uh, cabin uh, it was uh, the federal transportation funds, if anybody's here from the federal government or from highways, we certainly appreciate the, the help that was given to, at the time, Cabin Creek Quilts. James Tebow was the mover for that, and that cabin was built. So you have a good sense of the way folks lived, what Booker's cabin was like, and you also have uh, Amanda Johnson's home place, which is the park. And then there's another house that's, and all of these properties now are, are managed by West Virginia State University. And uh, uh, the other house is called Norton House, and it's a, a, a frame house, the oldest frame house in Malden. Um, I believe it's 1840, and uh, uh, it has no foundations per se. It's just got huge, huge, it's an interesting structure. It has, uh, it's not even on stones, as was the common practice. They have on huge, uh, 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 I almost like piles, but, but, but wooden trees that the termites have not been able to get through in all these years. So it's the oldest frame house in Malden. I'm not sure you have a lot of 1840 frame houses still. Dr. Hale's house is a brick house. So West Virginia State has, has the stewardship of all those properties and is doing a good job of maintaining them. Now, what I'd like to talk with you about is why I'm all of it. You know, and I, I tried to prepare for this and I thought there are themes that we need to discuss and consider. The first theme is who these folks were. The first theme is that we were a pioneer mountain society, totally different from Eastern Virginia. And so Eastern Virginia is an agrarian, wealthy, capitalistic economy built on slave labor uh, with patrician families who are very wealthy and very successful and very, very politically powerful and very interested in protecting their own interests. In the West, Western Virginia, before the Civil War, you, you have a group of people who are pioneers, even, even the patricians who were very successful and the, old, the four great salt maker families in Malden were Lewis, and they were part of the Andrew Lewis family. Shrewsbury, well, let me do Lewis, and, and of course, Ruffiners are the first to be able to develop coal. Uh, not coal, develop salt, which ends up becoming king coal. The Shrewsburys and the Dickinsons. Now, the Ruffiners come, and there's a different kind of society, folks. The Ruffiners come, and has anybody been to Craig Patton's house? I drove by as I came in. The Ruffner, original Ruffner cabin is there. It's a log cabin. So the Ruffners come to the Canal Valley in the, seven, in the late 1700s, as, uh, 1795, uh, living in a log cabin. And of course, they become these great salt makers and become very wealthy. But they're a different sort of group. Also, the, the Lewises were folks who started out in log cabins as well, not by the time they got here, but certainly uh, in, within a generation or two. All of the people who were salt makers at the early, in the early 1800s had relatives who had been either killed or, or, or endangered by Native Americans who were saying, we don't want your settlement, it's our land, get out. And there was a constant war. So not until, uh, the, the, this area was not secure until after the Revolutionary War, after the Constitution. It actually was in the, in the, in the 1790s that it could be secure, and it was based on uh, 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 Matt Anthony Wayne's taking of then says, in Indiana, so that uh, uh, the, the Native Americans were no longer in the Ohio Valley and they were secure. So these were folks who were frontiers people. John Williams says that it changed that because of our, our mountains and our, our economic base, which was not agri agrarian and it was not a, 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 an economy based upon the aggregation of wealth with uh, land uh, and agriculture, as in Eastern Virginia. We have never been able to maintain our own capital here. So our resources have usually been used by out-of-state folks, and that certainly has been, been true for us, that we never had the necessary agrarian capital to build our own industries and maintain those industries and the, and the benefit of those. So we have, we have a very different society. And if you study, if you study the, the elections, there are different election votes. Uh, uh, in, in, in 1830, there's a vote in the House of Delegates on abolition of slavery. And you can see the outline of West Virginia in the counties in the West that voted in favor of abolishing slavery versus the ones in the eastern part. So there's a great political divide that affects the state outline once the state is, is, is created. 
See, also this generation at the, in the early 1800s, when the roughners uh, really get the monopoly, they begin the monopoly on salt for the entire uh, Western United States. At that time, everything was new. I mean, we they had only been under the Constitution for 10, 15 years. Uh, uh, President of the United States was Thomas Jefferson when the Ruffners put the first deep well in America down in 1808 in Malden, right at the Campbell's Creek Light, if anybody knows what I'm talking about. They were able to go through about 50-some feet of solid bedrock uh, using, using two sycamore trees and, and different devices. And they're able to get through and get a really high quality of brine. And I hear so many people say salt mines. No, <laughs> we don't mine salt in Malden. We, we produce it because it's this salty brine that comes up. It was what, they knew it was there because remember we had the, we were the licks because the, the, the buffalo would come in and, 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 and the salt was just coming out of, the, out of the hill there. But they knew if they could get deep enough, they could get a good solid brine. And when they did, they got, a, they got a salt that they could produce. And of course, what happens? By 1850, there are 47 different salt uh, uh, production places. The names, if you go through the names of the streets in, in Charleston, almost every street is named for a salt maker. I mean, just, just, just name them all. You know, not just Dickinson, Lewis, uh, Shrewsbury, and Ruffner, but, but uh, Hale, and, and it just uh, it goes along and along. Almost all the streets in Charleston are named for old salt makers. Why are they important? They're important because Alistair Cook, in, in, in his famous, you know, he's really the first historian to go on TV and kind of make it fun and entertaining. Alistair Cook, in, in, in his uh, book and also the TV show, says that the essential ingredient in developing the West was salt. And he never mentions Malden, unfortunately. Well, let me tell you, the only salt you could get west of the Alleghenies was from Malden. From, from the eight, 18, uh, they really began production in 1817. You know, Dolly Madison's carrying the picture of George Washington out of the White House whenever it's being burned by the British in 1814, 1815. And in 1817, they've got a monopoly. They developed the first cartel. Uh, it's, it's a legal form. Uh, we hear today it's control markets. They decided we're going to set who's, who sells to what market, what the price is, and how much production is allowed. Well, that's what we've got with the oil industry today. That legal form began in Mullet. And of course, it's outlawed, thank goodness, uh, by the Sherman Antitrust Act uh, that Teddy Roosevelt was able to get in almost 100 years later. So they become very wealthy. The monopoly's broken when the when the Erie Canal comes through in the middle in the mid 1830s. And what that does is that allows other canals in Ohio to start shipping salt out of where? Michigan. Lots of salt in other places, but Michigan. And I think that's kind of interesting because it's Dow that bought out Union Carbide, the two great industrial giants. And, and the, the old salt makers from Michigan end up buying out the old salt makers from, from Malden, perhaps. But uh, that's a romantic. Now, so, so you have folks that, that they, have, they have a river, they have a resource, and they have uh, 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 the labor that they need. Well, what kind of labor do they need? We had another speaker here in this program who talked about uh, that if you look at the, the number of enslaved persons in the Canal Valley, it's really dramatic. Very few, 1810 census, very few, 1820. But by 1850, something like 15 to 20 percent of the population are African Americans. Why are they here? Well, they're here as industrial workers. Are they here as, 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 as owned slaves? Or are they here on leases from Virginia? A lot are on leases. John Steely wrote an incredible book on the antebellum salt industry. And he has a chapter that's fascinating. And it's called, I think it's called that, the antebellum salt industry of the Mount Valley. And he's a professor at Shepherd and, and is, is, is doing a, a, a large, a major work on West Virginia history that he's ready to publish soon. Uh, he also said something, you have to be cautious, he came to the J.R. Clifford play and, and had a great seminar and, and panel, and, and the next day we, were, it, it, we, we had a bar association meeting, and, and, he, and he cautioned, he didn't think that some of the parts of the play were historically accurate, and so he said, you know, uh, uh, if, I was a, if, if, if I tried to practice law, you'd put me in jail. He said, there's no penalty, apparently, for practicing history without a license. So, 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 so you have to, have to check people's research. But anyway, he wrote a chapter, and what, what they did, and it's very interesting, is the, the people were leased for six days a week. If they chose to work on Sunday, you say, are you kidding, seven days? Yes, these were special people. 
the seventh, the money for the seventh day on Sunday was kept until the Christmas holiday. And the workers then would go back to Old Virginia and take the, what they had made that year to have extra money for their families. And you say, well, wow, that's interesting. And Booker says that, that his stepfather, he's told when he's a little boy that this man that comes in at Christmas with money is his daddy. And he says, well, I don't think he's my daddy, but you know, he'd come and then he would leave. Well, he was at least slave. His name was Washington Ferguson. And he lured here before the Civil War. And this was one of these guys that was a little, little troublemaker. In other words, he had some spirit and some stuff about him. And he, he, when the war was on and he was leased to work in a factory in Lynchburg, when the federal troops came through, he escaped and came back to Mall and to work. And you say, well, why didn't he go out of, this was still slave territory, even under the, the, the entire Civil War, this was slave territory because this was not an area in rebellion against the United States. So the people who were enslaved here continued to be enslaved here. He came here because he knew something. What he knew was the kind of frontier value and mountain values that we have to say that there's only really one quality that's important about a, about a person, and that's the, how hard they work. And this is something that's very different. The status in a mountain culture is not birth. It's not how much money you've got. It's not the amount of land you have. It's how hard you work as an individual. And so he knew he would be honored, respected, and protected if he came here and worked during the end of the Civil War. He comes when the war is still, still undecided. Remember, the Civil War wasn't a given. You know, I mean, it took, it took many years before it became obvious that the North would win. So he does that. Interesting fellow. At the end of the war, he saved enough money to send for Booker, who's nine, his brother, who's 11, his sister, who I think is a two years younger than Booker, and his wife, who has emphysema and can't really walk all the way from Roanoke, Virginia, or Hillsford, uh, south of Roanoke, to the Kanawha Valley. So the minute the war's over, he sends them enough money there to get the cart and the mule to bring them up. It takes them up several weeks, a number of weeks to get here. It's a frightening trip. Can you imagine, you know, never ever being off the plantation, being allowed off, and then you're going to go on a, a 225-mile trek to a place you've never been? Okay. A lot of courage in the stories about Molly. Okay, so they get here, and <coughs> when I talked about themes, the first theme is, is a mountain culture based on family, uh, the Hatfield-McCoy uh, uh, presentation on the History Channel is really about family and, and, and clannishness. Uh, so you have that where work is, is respected. You also have worker housing. What's interesting is you can look at the, you look at the 1870 census and you discover that it's, it's, it's white family, white family, black family, black family, white, black, white, black, 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 white. So <laughs> completely integrated. All the housing, and you say, well, do you know what streets they're on? No, but, but a census taker would just go, used to know that they would go from house to house. And the census is in that way. And uh, uh, it's into, there's a lot of information in it. There's something really telling. In 1870, Wash Ferguson, that they call him Wash, Wash Ferguson shows that he has property valued at $500. Now, how does this happen? Well, it happens because he works day and night. And this is the work of his man. What happened, and, and, and I discovered this in the deeds, is in 1869, four years after the Civil War, this man is able to purchase the Booker cabin site for $500 from one of the young Shrewsbury's. And you say, where is it now? Well, it's, it's right there on the property line where the old Episcopal church was, right in, in effect in the middle of Mall. So he moves his family. Oh, and by the way, the family grew by one when they're leaving his wife finds a baby in a barn, and that's James. And they bring the baby with them, and James spends the rest of his life as an adopted member of the, of the Washington family. Ferguson family, I suppose, but he took the name Washington, too. His name was James. So, so the family's pretty big. He moves his family to Malden. What's important about that? This is where the, the, the thing, the thing, I don't know if it's a theme or a question, what is it about Malden that Booker T. Washington saw when he was a child that would help him become one of the most important leaders in America and in the world. Certainly, he's a great African-American. Du Bois uh, 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 
Professor Du Bois said that, that Booker T. Washington was the greatest man to come out of the South after the Civil War, between the Civil War and World War I, no question about that. Booker T. Washington, go on eBay. He's always got about 700 items if you want to check. Booker T. Washington is the, is the, the of West Virginia's only true paparazzi celebrity. <laughs> and there are, there are articles that there's, a, there's, there are pictures. When he would come to town, it would be publicized. And there's a picture of him. Booker T. Washington fishing in Fayette County. Booker T. Washington hunting in Nicholas County. Uh, Mary, Mary Lee Settle's book, uh, Abby, is a wonderful book. But she talks about her grandfather meeting Booker T. Washington on the train. Nobody knew how to deal with him. And this guy's a, a true celebrity, but what do you call him? Can you call him? And some people said that when he got a doctorate at Harvard that that made people comfortable because they could call him Dr. Washington. But still, what did they do? She said that, that her grandfather came home and said, I, I saw and met Booker T. Washington on the train. I shook his hand, but I didn't golf my hand. <laughs> the point is, of course, that, that, that Booker T. Washington really transcended the book Up From Slavery, which is published everywhere, very inexpensive, wonderful book. Uh, I recommend it to you, first chapters on his boyhood and all, but he's not real complimentary to us in the book, but it's okay. Uh, he, uh, he really outlines an autobiography, and it's been selected as the third best nonfiction book written in America in the 20th century. So this is a very important work and interesting to read as you, as you get older and you read it uh, uh, from a different age perspective, you get a different perspective on it. But, but Booker T. Washington is a great leader. What is it about Malden? Is there, any, is there anything special about Malden and West Virginia that helped make him the great leader he was? Now, I think that you can make that as a, a resounding yes. What was the number one thing? I think Washington first. I think the, the example that Washington Ferguson never gives him credit, never says that I name myself after my stepfather. He declines it. Doesn't say he named himself after George Washington. And all and his brothers and sisters use, use the name Washington. His mother wanted to use Talaferia. And in Franklin County, that's one of the, the, the well-to-do families' names is Talaferia. But he, he, he selected Washington because he was in school and said, I have to have a name. Never gave his father credit for that. And, and in the courthouse records, I found out, I think, the reason. But his, his stepfather made him work and work and work. They were living in Malden, and they became symbolic people of what African Americans can be with freedom and with, with, with being treated with dignity and respected for their hard work. So Booker saw that. He was, he was nine years old when he got here. He goes away to Hampton when he's about 15. His, his stepfather purchases the property. It's not really a purchase. It's a land contract where he gets the deed five years after he's pays $100 a year mortgage for the property. Um, uh, it, he really is the most substantial African American in Malden. There may be another uh, uh, person who has three or $400, but he lists on the 1870. Most people don't list any property. Most people don't have any property, white or black. But he lists $500 worth of property, which is the cap. 18, four years after the Civil four years after the Civil and it's, what's important is it's about three or four years before the African Zion Church comes to Malden. You say, well, what do you mean comes to Malden? Well, the African Zion Church community started in 1852. Uh, we had different sort of race relations here. You had the, the, uh, the people who were uh, enslaved and on an ownership basis in the Canal Valley were in generations. In other words, they were, grandparents were living with, with children and grandchildren. Very different from the Old South. Not just an economic, industrial sort of society. I, I don't know if there's another slave, enslaved uh, 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 industrial society in the Old South, but we were truly Old South. Uh, and the, uh, 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 we, had, we, we had an industrial society. But what he saw, what Booker saw from those eyes, I have a theory, and that, nobody's challenged me on this, and it's fair. I have a theory that boys, be difficult. But boys develop their their morality and their personhood through hero worship when they're about 8, 9, 10, 11 years old. And that's when Booker comes to Malden. Well, what's he find? Well, not only, you know, the folks who developed Malden were there when the new country is about. Well, when he gets there, it's a new state. Everything is bustling. All of the ideas of the past are, are gone. You know, 
the question, we had a township, at first they set up a township form of government, that didn't work, we go back to counties. You know, everything, all of a sudden it's a blank slate, politically, economically, everything after the war. What, what, how do we integrate and how do we, we have African Americans as a part of our society? Do we, do we use the Jim Crow laws like in Virginia, Eastern Virginia, in the Old South to keep, them, to keep African Americans degraded and down, make sure they had bad schools? None of that happened in West Virginia. Wasn't that sort of, wasn't that what? And the old salt makers, and what Booker saw when he was a boy in Marlwood were several things. Integrated housing. He saw when they brought, when his family was able to move to the middle of Marlwood and be symbolic of hardworking, good American stock, the kind of people that we want in our society, in the middle of our society, very publicly. They helped African Zion Baptist Church, which was a faith community in 1852, organized and helped by the Ruffin family. Then as soon as the, the Emancipation Proclamation was announced in 1863, the, the Ruffner family, I believe, whose property I was honored to purchase, and I got to talk with her when she was in a nursing home. Uh, but, but she also contended that the Ruffner family helped the, them become a, a, an organized Baptist church in, 18, I want to say, 1872. I get my dates wrong. First Baptist in Charleston is organized a year later, but the first African American black Baptist church in West Virginia is the African Zion Baptist Church. And that's the one I contend is a great icon. Why? Because it, it was down, it was a, a, a community of African Americans who lived down around Campbell's Creek called, in a place called Tinkersville. And there was a legendary man named Reverend Rice, who was the, the truly, I mean, one of these folks whose entire life was, was the spiritual leader of the community. He starts having schools at night. Booker wants to go there. He has to work. He says, Dad's all work. Uh, but, uh, but he has school. He has the church. And, and lo and behold, in 1872, the Methodists want to build a new church. And, and, and so they vacate their little brick building and sell it to the fellow who lives next door to it. Uh, for several, I can't remember, two or three hundred dollars. That's a decent amount of money. They, they build their, their new church. And the trustees, and the, the deed is, 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 is from uh, the landowner to the trustees of the African Zion Baptist Church of Tinkersville. And that deed is done in 1872. And they move the church to Mall. And you go, well, that's nice. But remember, there's no cars, though. You know, church in those days was not a, an hour or two in an air-conditioned building and then uh, with Bob Evans later, you know, for lunch. It was all day. And you go, wait a minute, you mean so the, the African Americans would have to come in carriages or, 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 or however to get up there with their food to be there all day to hear speeches and talks and the politicians would come in and the kids are running all over the place? Exactly. In the middle of the mall. And you say, well, what is this? A, is this a great icon because the whites were good? No. Because the blacks wanted to do it, and did, and they were invited and welcomed to do it. Now Booker in his book says that he observes a pitched battle between a hundred Ku Klux Klansmen and a hundred African Americans and their support and their white supporters in Mall. So we this was not a peaceful, necessarily a peaceful coming together. It took courage and it took strength. And he says that he saw old General Ruffner, Louis Ruffner be injured in a melee where he, what happens is he gets hit in the back of the head with a brick. He going, there's a problem and he decides, you know, I'm going to go take care of it. He's an old man at the time. And who is Louis Ruffin? The first African, I'm sorry, the first European baby born in the Kanawha Valley. He's born down in the stockade when, when, when the Native Americans were still a threat here. Born in 18, I want to say 75. Uh, he is the son of David Ruffner, one of the two brothers who, who dug the deep well became very wealthy doing it. Uh, he, he, he had a brother named uh, Henry Ruffner, who was a Presbyterian minister and organized all the Presbyterian uh, churches in this area, in Malden first, and then uh, First Presby in Charleston. David Ruffner is the man who gave the property for Mercer Academy, which is where uh, the Presbyterian church in Charleston was, was built. The Ruffner family is very important in terms of Henry Ruffner, you may remember, was an educator, was president of Washington College, now Washington Lee University, and had the, uh, well, he, he, he gave a paper, an academic paper, in 1847, saying, uh, pamphlet, saying that as a salt 
make her slaveholding family in the South, I think that we should abolish slavery. Well, all of his peers in the room thought, what a nice thing, you should publish that. Of course he does, and literally gets run out of the state of Virginia, well, left eastern Virginia, comes home really a broken man, and, and sets up a school in Malden, and, and dies right before the Civil War. You, know, but you just wish that he could have lived five or six more years to see, to see the benefit of what his thoughts were. Lewis Ruffner, I, I also had a newspaper article, and Louisville went to abolitionist meetings in 1847. So both of them had, had, had some, uh, of course, were unionists, I suppose, although there are Ruffners who were Confederates. The Shrewsbury's famous Confederates. Uh, uh, the uh, Dickinson's famous Confederates, so generals and, and colonels and so on. Uh, so this was pretty much a southern area, but it was controlled by the federal troops. Uh, the, the Ruffners uh, helped or helped organize the, uh, the salt industry, but also, as the salt industry goes down, a lot of the, the old salt families start organizing the coal industry. And so when we go back to what did Booker see, he saw integrated housing and workers and people valued on the basis of their work. How were they valued? This is the most important point, maybe to remember when you leave here tonight, and that is that they pay equal pay for equal work. A shocking, unusual, not heard of anywhere else in the South, concept. And you go, that's decent industrial relations, isn't it? I mean, why would, you know, isn't it? Yeah, underground in, in the coal industry, they did the same. In Malden, they paid equal wages, which is one reason that the, 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 the person in one of the companies. Okay. The, and we didn't have Jim Crow laws, uh, the laws in the state, no. Jim Crow laws that you couldn't ride in the same train car. If you wanted to take a train with an African-American tram as a white person, you go down to Clifton Forest, the conductor would come through and say, you all have to separate. And you might think, well, the white person maybe could go on to the, to the African-American car. No, it was illegal for anybody that was white. Why is it? And you may have seen a recent documentary about Loving versus Virginia. Virginia into the, what is it, the 1960s, 70s, outlawed in a racial <coughs> marriage, put people in jail for, for being married. So there were lots of differences between West Virginia. So Booker saw integrated housing. He saw a value on labor to the point of equal pay for equal work. And he saw institutions. I mean, the importance of the, of the church is it's, a, it's an African-American institution at a time when there were no institutions. That was it. And what do they do? They move it out of their community to be a part of Mall, a part of, of where the other churches were, the Methodist and the Baptist church. So he saw those things, equal pay for equal work, high priority on education. But remember West Virginia, one of the gripes about West Virginia and Virginia was that we didn't, we wanted, we wanted road improvements and we wanted uh, government tax-based schools, free schools. And so they were setting those up after the Civil War. So he saw three important things, equal pay for equal work, which is a respect for individual labor, integration of housing, uh, integration of institutions and, and, and society that you had. And the, and the third thing is education as a way of improving the degraded people and letting them become a part of society. Those three things were important. He saw that, but he also saw Wash Ferguson as the hardest working guy, the, the most successful African American in the moment. And Lewis Harlan says that somehow, for some reason, Wash Ferguson disappears. Now, you know, he got the Pulitzer Prize for taking one million sheets of paper and organizing Booker T. Washington's papers uh, out of the University of Illinois, six volume set. He writes that somehow Washington Ferguson disappears and is never heard or seen in Booker's papers after that. Now, there's an article, newspaper article at the turn of the century, where, where Booker comes back and he meets with his, his, his stepfather and there's, you know, they're cordial and everything. What happened was when his mother died, remember Booker and his, and his brother had to, had to, to uh, work and they they made the Booker made 30 30 some dollars I can't remember 31 or 32 dollars a year living with the Ruffners and and, and and being a house boy there and that money most likely went to pay that hundred dollar mortgage because remember people were subsistence at the time so that extra money for that mortgage probably came from Booker about thirty dollars and another thirty dollars from from his brother uh, John his older brother John well what happens when his mom died He's at college, he, or he's a parent in school. His mom passes away, and his father, uh, after trying to make it on his own, uh, with some help from his sister Amanda, decides to get married. And he marries a woman who's two years younger than the man. Yeah, and that's okay. I mean, that's all right. 
but he feeds a life estate to Elizabeth on his death. Because when he gets married, he doesn't just get married, but he deeds the cabin property to his new wife as a life estate. Now, what happens, of course, is when he dies, she conveys it to a man. But it's my belief that based on that, that's why Washington Ferguson disappears in Booker's paper. You say, now, why would you say that? Well, I grew up in West Virginia. I know what the silence is. <laughs> if, you, if, you, you know, if, you've got, if you've got a horse thief or, or, or a, a drunkard or whatever in your family, there's just a silence. Just, they, just, they aren't there anymore. You know, how many kids was it? Four. Well, uh, three. <laughs> I really believe that that's what happened. And there's even a book, there's a book written by a professor about Booker, you know, perhaps Oedipus complexes and difficulty and why he would just sort of ignore his stepfather when it seems logical that that's where he got his name. I remember when I was working at Peterstown, to the older generation, I wasn't Larry and I wasn't Rudd. I was Claude's boy. That's my grandfather. I was Claude's boy. And I, you just know that when this kid's running around, and he was spectacular, he was really bright, he gets on... He, he goes stowaway on a steamship down to Cincinnati. They, get, they catch him about halfway through. And, he, and they say, well, we, you've got to go back to Mullen. You, you, you know, you can't do this, young man. We're going to send you back to Mullen. He says, well, you know, let's think about this. You know, if I just went down to Cincinnati, with you, I could come back and be no trouble at all. And, and also, he, he, he wanted to get to school early, so he set the clock back and they caught him doing that. So this, this kid's well known. So how would they refer to him? They wouldn't call him Booker. They call him Washington. That's, that's probably, but, he, he, but he's very oblique about his name, and there's nothing definite, but I really believe he named himself for his icon, who was his stepfather, because of the kind of worker he was, the kind of respect he obviously had in Malden, such respect that he was able to purchase property in the middle of Malden, and within three years after they've been living there, mom takes in laundry, he, he works day and night, makes the kids work, within three years they bring the African Zion Church, you say, wait, you mean the whites? Bring? No, no, I'm saying that the blacks, the trustees of the African Zion Baptist Church of Tankersville, decide to move to the Middle of Mall, where they have to travel. A lot of them would have to travel much farther than they would if they stayed put in little Tankersville, down where the Mount of Campbell's Creek is. So, so you, have, you have these iconic things that, that Booker saw. Now, let's zip through to, to election night, 2008. I'm sitting at home. And I'm thinking this is a historical time. And John McCain says in a very gracious concession speech, just electrified me, I think I went straight up off the couch. He said, a hundred years ago, a man named Booker T. Washington created an international sensation by having dinner with the President of the United States in the White House. Tonight, we've elected an African American as President. Now, how do we get there? You know, and, and this isn't a political thing. We talk about politics and Democrats and Republicans. It's, it's more than symbolic. It's a statement by America of who we are, that we value who people are, not their color, not their, their class, not their wealth, although having money certainly helps in politics. But, it, but, but who individuals are, that we actually finally, finally have delivered on the Declaration of Independence. That all men, sorry about the men part, I always have to man people, you know. <laughs> women, women couldn't own property until after the Civil War. Uh, we, we had, it took us to 1920 uh, to, to, to get women the right to vote. I mean, you know, it took 1970 to get women's rights and, and to let girls play sports like boys and so on. So anyway, there's all kinds of things in there. Finally, we got it. Finally. An African American can believe what white kids always did, and what is always told. So you, you can be anything you want. You can be President of the United States, and we all grew up believing it. But there was always a footnote for African American kids. Someday. Maybe not you. Someday. We believe in America. Someday. All right. Let's sit through to that. All right. Let, let's in between Booker. And please understand that Booker's great contribution to American society is the rock hard belief that being middle class, i.e. hard work, living not for Saturday night, but living for your children and their children. And that's how I define middle class. Somebody said, what is middle class to you? I said, that's where you live your life for your children and your grandchildren. 
and contribute to society in that way. That was Booker's rock hard belief because that's what he saw in Paul. Okay, people criticize, say, well, you know, you should have been more on the political end. You should have done this, you should have done that. He's the only African American leader to, to actually operate in the old South. The others all were in, in Harlem. But, but if we sort of zip through to, to a, a, a young man who's a West Virginia State College basketball scholarship player, has two churches, and of course we named Leon Sullivan Way for him, uh, is, is in uh, at West Virginia State. Adam Clayton Cow Jr. sees him while he's in school and says, look, when you, when you finish school, I want you to come to, to New York, to Harlem, the largest African American church, and, uh, and you can be a preacher there with, with my dad, Adam Clayton Powell, and, and, I, and I, so Adam Clayton Powell Jr., will make sure that you are treated well in New York. He does that and goes, and if you read the book Moving Mountains, very interesting book, uh, uh, he, he just comes to a part, I, if you remember, it's Adam Clayton Powell who's sort of running around and having all kinds of issues and money issues and things, and Congress throws him out, and then he's reelected, and the Supreme Court had to decide the important case, if the people elect him, can they, can, does he, they have to find something else on him, or can he can be, be barred for life? And the Supreme Court said, no, if they elect him, they, you know, you, the, the slate starts clean, so he goes back into Congress. Well, things are sort of happening, getting a little funny in New York. He says in his book, Moving Mountains, that uh, my wife says that my wife said it was time to leave New York. And I always say to kids, when your wife says it's time to leave, it's time to go. <laughs> so what does he do? He goes to New, he goes to Philadelphia and has a small church, and then gets a bigger church. And he says a very simple thing. He says, you know, I don't understand this. We're eating these cakes made in a bakery that won't hire us. Why are we doing that? Let's just stop eating them. When they want to hire African Americans, we'll start eating their cakes again. Boycotts all over Philadelphia. He was able to integrate almost all the employers in the Philadelphia area. He became very famous nationwide for the boycotts. If you remember the boycotts of that, that era, and it's Leon Sullivan who did it. He gets appointed to, the, to talk about change, gets appointed to uh, uh, General Motors as the first African American board member, then the richest, the most powerful corporation in America. That's changed, but General Motors is doing much better, thank goodness. But he gives a speech, kind of incidentally, and says, he just gives a speech, you know, I don't understand why we're doing business with South Africa. It's modern slavery. They treat their native population like they're like slaves. I mean, they don't let them have anything. If they've taken their land, I mean, why are we dealing with it? So organ he organized the international corporate boycott of South Africa. People, so you couldn't play sports there. You couldn't do anything. And, and he was able to get it done in his lifetime. I think one of the big, great sad things about Booker's life is he dies at age 59 of what? Blood pressure, high blood pressure. <clears throat> you know, but he lived to be only 59. Almost all the other African-American leaders lived into their 80s or 90s. Du Bois goes to 95. Uh, but Leon Sullivan lives to be, I think, about 82. Lives long enough to see his dream of South Africa changing over in the 1990s. He said it would take 15 years. People said, that's terrible. A whole generation of these, uh, of these African American uh, folks under apartheid are going to be subjected, a whole, whole generation. Why don't we do it now? He said, TTT, things take time. And that, that's Booker. You know, Booker said, look, I'm not doing it for me or my generation or my kids, but we'll do it eventually because we, we will grow into being a middle class. So, what? so Leon Sullivan also organizes the boycott, but then he develops principles that we use to determine whether a country can participate in the world community of nations. What are those principles? You can, there are seven or eight, but you can boil them down to these. Integration of, of housing and, and public accommodations. High priority on education as a way of bringing a degraded people up and, and being included in society. And equal pay for equal. Well, where is that coming? I mean, that comes from, I mean, there's a thread there, folks. That comes from the way Leon Sullivan grew up and what he saw in downtown Charleston. And his grandmother, I think he was raised by his grandmother. She took him laundry. It was difficult. He got a basketball scholarship to West Virginia State then College and, 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 and makes good on his beliefs and what he saw as a child as a way people are supposed to live together. Well, it comes from Booker. If there had not been a strong black middle class, Obama would have never been elected president of the United States. It took, it took the development, and it took much longer than it should. 
and I almost reversed on this. At first, I thought I was a little outraged at the idea that we should, that if if the old slave owners had been paid for their property, reimbursed for their property rights, that we would have. I just thought it was an outrage to even think of it. But now, as I'm getting older and I'm thinking about it, had that been done, had the social system of the South been sort of left alone and protected, it may have been a lot easier. So we did and we did not have a great upheaval financially here in the Kanawha Valley uh, as a result of the abolition of slavery. And so you didn't have in this in this mountain economy and, and mountain value, family value period, you didn't have uh, uh, as, as much uh, uh, discord and hatred. I mean, the, 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 when you read, and I don't think I brought it as one of the books, there's a book from a University of Tennessee professor uh, called Up From History, and it details what Booker had to live through and just to survive. I mean, uh, George Washington Carver and his friends are going to a wedding and they're dressed up on a train. And here's the greatest scientist in the world. And they're going to a wedding and these whites go crazy and decide to attack the train. And George Washington Carver in a suit had to run through, through fields and briar patches to get back to Tuskegee to not be hung. Now that was the kind of society that Booker had to, had to deal with. That kind of fierce hatred. You know, West Virginia is different. Uh, it's kind of interesting. The state Supreme Court in West Virginia, you know, outlawed the showing of a movie. And it was the birth of a nation. African Americans went to the Supreme Court and said, that's, that's inflammatory, it's, it's, it's slanderous, because you know it was. I mean, it, it's, it portrays uh, uh, African Americans as, as, as attacking women, you know, white, pure women, and all that. It's a horrific movie. The KKK is, is, is glorified. Our Supreme Court got what happened today because you can't you can't censor a movie. And I'm thinking, wait, they're even paper censorship. Well, no, I mean, that movie was really rough. West Virginia is a very different place. And you say, is it because because the abolition of slavery was not you know, completely a, a disrupting a force to political and social and economic institutions of the state? Part of it, that's part of it. All those institutions were building and changing with the development of the railroads and the coal industry in West Virginia. But what's important is the coal industry was developed based on those same kind of industrial relations. People pay for equal work. Now, clearly, there's no question of discrimination because probably the whites got the better jobs underground. But if you did a certain job underground, you were paid for that job. And that was never done anywhere else in the old South. Uh, West Virginia State had a seminar and they had vice presidents from a number of HBC colleges to come. And I gave this talk, and the, the vice president of uh, Virginia State came up to me and he said, I have never heard that. I never, ever understood what, why Booker T. Washington believed it as, as he did in the, uh, um, you know, the, the, uh, in middle class and working and so on. I never understood it. He said, until you said that they were, it was equal pay for equal work. And, and he said, my entire growing up in Virginia, I never got paid the same amount of money as a white man. Never. Wasn't allowed. Do the same job. Yes, sir. Before you left uh, Leon Sullivan, I just want to break, break it back low. He had an OIC right at the bottom of the oh, Capitol. Oh, he yes. Was, he organized a tremendous organization. Yes, he, he, OIC uh, was a, 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 a sort of a vocation. It's almost like a workforce development program where they, and, and they emphasized, uh, and Booker was big on it. He said the most important thing you can do is brush your teeth. <laughs> He said health is the most important thing. You know, 100 years ago, you didn't take things for granted, whether it was water or whatever. He said health is the most important thing. You've got to brush your teeth. Uh, you've got to, 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 to be clean and, and, and proper to be a part of society. And a part of the OIC program was that they taught social graces and, and manners, table manners, and, and all sorts of things as a part of the, the whole development. And it was sort of a job skill, yes, but also a general education and, and those things. Yes. And they took on diversity. You said in classes you, you, you work with the diversity issues. I, I, had, I was a social worker in the 70s. And I had uh, many kids, and some of these kids would come up from uh, Cadbury, and their parents come into Charleston. It was a little strange mix, but they took that on, and they, they worked that program. It was a very good program. And this was all over the country, OIC. Opportunity Industrialization Center. Centers. And uh, uh, the program is, it, I, there aren't as many now, but there were hundreds around the country, very important program. Yes, Leon Sullivan was, was one of the great ones, and, and we were so delighted that we were able to name the street for him, have him come back and, and, and feel honored, I think, by his, by his, his, his hometown folks. 
So, so we, we kind of get to the point, what was it that Booker saw in Old Malta when he was growing up? You know, he saw integrated housing, he saw equal pay for equal work, he saw respect for individuals and hard work, he saw that, 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 that family, I mean, that family was important, your social class was not, that you could do it, that America was true to its dream, you, you can be something, you can, as he did, he came from slavery and becomes uh, one of the most well-known celebrities in the world. He's friends with, with Andrew Carnegie who gave him, I think it was $300,000, and in cash, he said, this is not for your school, this is for you. Anybody that is important to America as you are should have the funds to not have to worry about your family or anything else. And uh, he, was, he was with those giants, and he really was something. What else did he see in law? He saw, an, I think, an iconic character in his stepfather. Somebody who just worked hard and believed that if he worked hard, saved his money, got the property, good things would happen. And then he saw the social institution, the, the social institution, which was its church, come out of the community, the African-American community, into the middle of Malden, and to be honored and respected there. He saw that happen. What else did he see? He saw education. Schools were being set up in the Canal Valley. And you have to love some of it. If you go back into history, some of the folks that, that were being taxed for it were saying, are you serious? The government's going to tax me to set up schools? <laughs> What's that about? I, I'm not going to pay. They imposed it. Some of, some of our salt maker families were particularly opposed to it. The interesting thing about Lewis Ruffner. Lewis Ruffner was in, this, in the Virginia legislature early in his years. His dad gave him the, the family business to manage, while older brother Henry is off to Western College and, and being a, a, a scholar. Lewis Ruffner gets out of politics, and you just feel like it probably was the time where he really thought abolition might be a decent idea if we don't want to be in politics. Or but, he is, when he goes, he is our representative in the Wheeling Convention. And, and, and the, I really appreciate the J.R. Clifford folks. I was able to go through and look at the, the volumes. You know, the uh, fellow who was a scrivener wrote all of the, the argument and all of the, the discussion in the Wheeling Convention. Lewis Ruffner doesn't say anything until it comes to what? The payment for the loss of property with the abolition remember statehood, the one thing that blocked us from having, we would have been a state, I think, in February instead of June. The one thing that blocked us was uh, we provided for slavery and for people to be paid for the loss of, of slaves as their property. And Lewis Ruffner talks about that and proposes that idea. And I, I say, I, I think it's my romantic view of the Ruffners and, and the old salt makers, but I kind of flipped around on that, that issue. Uh, he's, he, that's, that's, that's his main thing in, in the, the, the convention. But uh, he is uh, really an, an unusual character and, and, and was a, the leader of the Kanawha Valley. Uh, uh, in that process for statehood, we had, we had the Willie Amendment. If you remember, Senator, one senator ended up opposing statehood. And Senator Willie and the reconstructed government of Virginia goes to Lincoln and says, look, I'll write an amendment. We'll amend our Constitution to provide for the gradual elimination of slavery if that's, if that's what it will take for us to be a state. You know the statue out here, Lincoln at midnight, is his, you know, trying to ponder whether or not to make West Virginia state. That really is, that was a, that, that was a, a night meeting. He had to, uh, to deal with the Emancipation Proclamation and whether West Virginia would be a state. So he's thinking about it. Senator Willie gets him to, Say. So then uh, Lincoln says, all right, I'll sign it, but you've got to amend the <coughs> Constitution to eliminate slavery. And so they do that, at least on a gradual basis. They come back and they have to go through the convention again and get a, get a change. And so then they were really confronted with the issue about whether people would be paid for that loss of property. And that's when Lewis Rutgers takes up. Uh, the, uh, uh, so what we've got really is, 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 a, is a history that and, and I'm always reminded of Professor Steele, he sort of sits on his shoulder if I'm practicing history without a license, you know, you've got to be careful. But I think these themes are true and fair. I, and I think that we ought to be very proud and happy of, of our culture and, and the state that we, that we are and that we become. And that we have a reason to be proud of our race relations in West Virginia, proud of the differences between here and the, and the 
rest of the South. When I was growing up, there was no doubt in my mind that we were a Southern state. We were below the Mason. How many people have heard the word Mason Dixon in the last 20 years? Well, you know, when I was growing up, the whole world was South and North. You know, and we really, we really, West Virginia, I now, I don't know if we're a Southern state or not. You know, we're more of a mountain state. But in those days, please understand, we truly were a Southern state. We were a part of the Old South. Slavery was embedded in the culture. Uh, uh, you had people here who were patrician and wealthy, but they came in rough, in, in rough uh, log cabins to start out. They, they, had, they were frontiers people who really had to struggle just to survive. They, their survival was always a day to And it made them respect other people <coughs> and rely on their neighbors. In Virginia, where you had great wealth, uh, the classes never, never really came come into contact with each other totally different sort of society. Uh, the Jim Crow laws that are really vicious and really prominent, including in eastern Virginia, that prevent people from using the same water fountains, the same school. Now, West Virginia had segregated schools, there's no question. But the magic is the J.R. Clifford uh, point, and he won that case. He's the first African-American attorney. Won, won the case, which is out of Tucker County, where the school system said, look, we're, we're not going to pay the teachers the same amount as they're teaching African-Americans. So he takes the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says no. That our, our Constitution says that we have separated schools. But what's essential in it is that, air, that the same amount of money for an African American child has to be spent as it is on uh, the education of a white child. And we have always maintained that. And that's a huge difference. Another key element is, and Booker was a part of this, African Americans in West Virginia always had political clout because we were almost equally divided between Republicans who were the new developing people, the railroad, the coal people, the uh, timber people, and, and all that, and the, and the Democrats who were the more southern uh, established folks. And that political balance was, was kept by the African Americans who voted almost always Republican. The reason that Booker T. Washington had great political power was we had a run of 12 years of Republican <coughs> president. And of course, he was, he was very friendly with Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt had him to dinner several times in New York when he was governor, no problem. But when he went to the White House, neither one of them really knew what was going to happen. They were really, they were surprised. And it wasn't there. At first they said, well, it wasn't really dinner. Oh, it was dinner. Uh, it wasn't really in the with the family. It was with the family, the kids, the wife. It was real dinner. It was incidental. And 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 he got, and Booker didn't want to go. He knew, he knew it would be trouble. And so uh, when he goes, the news is out of the news after the dinner. And it is a sensation in the South. I mean, they're, they're ready to, you know, war, Civil War number two. You know, it was absolutely unbelievable. It went on all over the world. This was known all over the world. And, and, and Teddy Roosevelt backs off and says, well, I didn't really mean for it to be symbolic. We just had dinner. I'm sorry. You know, it's not, we're not announcing a new relationship with African Americans or anything. Booker has to go underground for two or three months. There's a United States Senator. <coughs> uh, oh. <coughs> South Carolina actually said it's a uh, uh, table. It wouldn't have hurt any. I think of the laws that are probably getting in jail when you got any president of the United States, but very different times. And whenever you go back to those times and you see this little boy in Mullen seeing the things that he sees, you understand why he becomes a great leader why he has the philosophy and theory that he does. That, look, it's not for us. It doesn't have to be now. We can suffer. We can survive. We work. We do what we need to. We get our children to work, get their education, make their contributions, not for themselves, but for the next generation. And eventually, it works. And I think that we ought to give Booker T. Washington credit for that. And I think that we in Malden, those of us in our area, ought to take a little, a little bit of pride in that, too. Thank you all very much. Do we have questions? I well, uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce Larry Rowe. <laughs>
This team was runner-up this year. Uh, they didn't win at all, but they came far. But the great thing is, how many uh, how many goals were shoes? Okay, Horace, Horace Mann, my son looked it up, had 30 golden horseshoes going into his year, and, and there were three in his year, which was last year, he was one, and, and, uh, and then there were two this year. Now, I, they weren't my students per se, but, we, but Horace Mann had five, so, so do the percentage, but uh, we, we've done very well lately. And but he's been forthcoming and giving in his time for the next generation. I appreciate well, I, 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 thank you. I, I would go every Monday at lunchtime and meet with these kids. And it's like our new series, <coughs> eighth graders that we want to talk about this stuff. <laughs> You're all. And I'll tell you, you have complete faith that this country is going to be a great hand for your middle school lives. Now, there's some other middle schools that <laughs> maybe aren't going to instill as much confidence. <laughs> but, but no, we, we, we were runner-up in the, the regionals. I should tell you about history, but you need to follow this. I predict that it will be uh, <coughs> a, more, a more important uh, event even than the Golden Horseshoe, which is very unusual, by the way. Other states don't do what the Golden Horseshoe does for the test. But the history balls were organized by the commission and, and, and Brian and, uh, uh, and, and others here. And what they do is in the eight RISA regions, which are educational <coughs> They have tournaments uh, and it's quiz ball sort of stuff on West Virginia history, not just history, but also uh, West Virginia, you know, who's, uh, you know, what movie theater, the Albion, Huntington, that's those kinds of, of, of interesting cultural things. And so they have to, the top two teams in the region go to the state. And so they, uh, and so Horace Mann was, was runner up last year, consistently won the region. And then last year, they were runner up state champions. And then this year, uh, we won the regional, Sissonville was runner-up, and we placed second as state champions. And we didn't do well in the very last round. We were undefeated until then. We were confident that we were going to win. <laughs> so there was real disappointment. And I don't know if you know this or not, but when they, they just felt like they lost. And I go, no, you didn't. You're one of our state champions. I mean, name any of your sports friends that, that are in the state championship anything. Eighth grade, there's no state championship. Don't you understand? So when they go back to middle school, they are hero, <laughs> state champion, runners up, second in the state, and all of a sudden they kind of blossom and bloom, and they really are more special kids. But it's a great program, and, and I, I hope that it continues to grow. Yes, sir. I just want to say, uh, my great grandfather, William Davis, was the first teacher of Booker T. Washington, and uh, he's also the only. I use the word black. Black man to run for governor of the state of West Virginia in 1890. Because Republican, Democrats, the Union Party, the <coughs> few other parties that the blacks of Malden and Tinkersville and all that area decided that they needed someone else to run for governor. So they nominated uh, my grandfather to run for governor, and Booker T. Washington was nominated as Secretary of Treasury. So uh, that's a little bit of history. And there's uh, one of the few things about Maul and his politics is it says he goes to a Republican rally or meeting in Maul that were uh, like 1890 something or other. But yes, uh, uh, Mr. Davis was, was, was the key and really the first, really the first African American educator, one of the first school educators in, in, in West Virginia. I mean, he really was, you know, his contribution came from Ohio, I think. Well, Ohio. Yeah. But he had been in the, uh, he had been in Lincoln's guard, Republican guard. He was a cook just like his father was. And when you mentioned that steamboat trip, it reminded me that my great great grandfather was a cook on the steamship, and my great grandfather followed him until he came back to Charleston. They would come and get salt here in Charleston and take it back to Cincinnati for the meat pack. And like I said, you know, it goes in history. The story says, you know, he came back, he met a woman, so he decided to stay in Charleston. And that's how. Reverend Rice found my great grandfather to be a school teacher because he was the only one at that time who could read and write. And originally, because they hadn't, the state hadn't set up the schools, all of the African Americans were taught in the churches. Right. And there were many, many uh, senior citizens, we'll say, who, who went to school to learn to read so they could read the Bible in their own times. And I think that's you know, just remarkable the kind of folks. And these are the people that look and grew up with. Real pioneers, people who don't have a program for their life, who who just do what they do and, and 
are respected by the community for. Good, good point. And in talking about how important the salt is, that's a good point. It was, the city of Cincinnati was built on, on the salt from Malta because that was a pork packing city. And the queen city of, of, of the Ohio, Cincinnati, was built on Malta salt. Because the only salt you could get in the entire western United States was from Malta. And they became very wealthy. Yes, ma'am. My maternal grandmother was born in Malta. She was a stroker, and I know you know the stroker. And my aunt is married to an Isaac. My mother's grandfather was Samuel Campbell that married Mary Barnes at West Virginia State University. On the Campbell land. Yes, yes. Folks story. know the story yes. of the yes. yes. great Samuel story. Yes. And, and Samuel Cavill and, <laughs> and Mary Barnes. Uh, I think he has 14 children, and she's, she's enslaved. I just would like to see a TV or, 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 or a movie about what it would be like for this woman who has had all these children by this man. She, she wills her freedom, her children's freedom, and all of his lands, which when we talk about Western State, we're talking about all, I guess, all of Dunbar all the way out. Can you imagine her taking that will to the forehead? <laughs> Lose that paper and the life changes, yeah. And, and let me say, over at West Virginia State, I need to put them by there. The, strip, the beautiful campus of West Virginia State is on one of the strips. What they did is when, when the property was divided up, the, the heirs got there, and the others were sold off. But I think one of the, one of the original heirs conveyed to, uh, to the college. And, and of course, what, West Virginia State was established in 1891 with the guiding hand, hand of Booker T. Washington. Booker was in, involved in a lot of that. It's kind of interesting politically. It was to be Store College. And the, the Morrell Act uh, established land grant universities. And all it meant was the federal government was going to give enough land to be sold that if you built the university, WVU, Ohio State, and so on, then we'll give you the money from the sale of the government lands in order to help fund the school. Well, in 1890, the they passed the second act for HBCU, or Historic Black uh, uh, Colleges. And they were HBCUs then, they were the black, they were the black colleges. They said if, if the state will establish, we'll do the same thing. Should have been in store, they thought. Well, there's a, a, a Kanawha County delegate. All of the, the only history is the Kanawha County delegate makes a motion that the college be built in Kanawha County. And, uh, and it passes, and lo and behold, West Virginia State is born. And, and, and they are, are, are built on the, one, of the, one of the strips of the original cattle, cattle property. Pretty, pretty incredible history. Yes, sir. Is, that, is the federal uh, cemetery, is that on? State's property, or is that adjacent to it? The, the brand new, the brand new federal center. I, I don't know. Yeah. It's a federal yeah. state park. I don't know. I don't know. It's a state. It's over for the state police barracks. Oh, it's a state park. Okay, I haven't seen. I haven't seen. It's behind the police headquarters. Oh, on the hill. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Please. Are you going to mention anything at all about the Stone House? The, the Shrewsbury. The Stone House, yeah. Okay. And if you, if you go, if you see all the plants, and then there's sort of a, an open field that used to be a plant, and if you go up toward Bell, you'll look over and you'll see an old Stone House there. That is, that is Shrewsbury House. It was built in 1800. And, and as I understand it, two Shrewsbury boys married two Dickinson girls. Now, throughout, uh, for generations, the Dickinsons and Shrewsburys intermarried. And what was unfortunate is that you'd have Joel and then Joel Jr. and then you started with Joel again. And so it's really hard. Historians are just made crazy trying to figure out who's who. But there's another house there. which Joel Shrewsbury is, the, is sort of the, the, the leader of the family. And, and his house, I think, is the red brick house. And there's no land. The Shrewsburys were unique. They didn't really own property. They were land. And the, the young Shrewsbury fellow who deeded to, to Booker's did the land contract and deeded to, to Booker's uh, stepfather, lived in the brick house that's on the river called the Oaks House. And they were relatives, and they lived in there and paid rent for 25 years before and after the Civil War. But the Shrewsburys started there, and then the Dickinsons came. So when I was talking about coming in log cabins, the Shrewsburys and Dickinsons didn't start here in log cabins. They were patricians from, from Virginia, and they came uh, in groups and, and organized the Salt Trust. And what's interesting, of Joel Shrewsbury and I want to say William, I'm not sure, uh, Dickinson. They did business together until they got in, I think, to their 80s and then sued each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, oh, the property division, and I mean, it all went to commissioners, and it was it's quite, quite a tale. Interesting, interesting two families. But that's the old Stonehouse in Dale. 
And, and what you find is if you go up there, you'll keep, every once in a while you'll see an old house. There's an old house that is a law firm house that was saved. And that was the old manse for the Canal Salient Presbyterian Church. And it's a white brick building that sits on the, the, the straight stretch through Malden. And it was built by uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, he, he, uh, he's the one who laid out the subdivision. And, and I, I'm, just, I'm just drawing blank. But it was the manse for the Canal Valley, for the Canal Presbyterian Church. Now, I live next door to the Canal Valley, I'm sorry, to the Canal Salem's Presbyterian Church. I'm saying it's wrong. And that's the first Presbyterian church in, in, in this area, in, in the whole western part of, of, of Virginia, organized by Henry Ruffin. And, uh, uh, and, and the building is 1839. And it's a lovely building. And, and there are, there are, you say, is that Booker's church? Booker would have been in the they call the slave balcony in the back, probably because the Ruffners attended that church and he would have gone with the family probably to church. There is a, a statement, I believe it's in one of the church histories, that one of the ministers taught Booker his catechism, Presbyterians have catechism, his catechism in his kitchen. I remember, you know, I shook his hand, I didn't doff my hand. Booker got taught the catechism by the, by the minister there, but in his kitchen. To us, just it seems pointless, but it was important in those days. The buildings in Malden have uh, James Tebow, is the fellow who came from uh, Massachusetts, uh, another Massachusetts uh, fellow coming, Mr. Hewitt, and now James Tebow, came as a visitor worker, and he's organized cavalry corps. And he was living in Estale, and then decided he moved, and he found, found Malden and said, This feels like a million and something. Because the, the houses sit in the front, there are alleys in the back, uh, there's more room in the back than the front, and of course it was laid out in 1830 by the, by the Ruffner family and by Dr. Uh, I'm just drawing a blank, uh, uh, to be, and it was organized as salt work. So you had Buffalo Road, and then Canal Savings, and then the subdivision was Salt Borough, uh, B O R O U G H Borough. And then somewhere along the line, it became Mall. And, so, and you say, well, it's got to be obvious. If you look at the deeds in the 18, late 1850s, they start saying Mall. It just comes out of the blue. It may be crazy. But I think that article is probably correct if it makes sense that it was named for Mall. It's just, I don't know why. I don't know what the significance of it would be. And it's sort of like, well, why would the town change names? Well, who knows? Uh, the salt end of Mall, compared to Charleston, wasn't a very nice town. Industrial smelly. Can you imagine? I mean, the only way you made salt was by a fuel source, and I should point out that the rural discovery of natural gas is at Burning Springs, where DuPont Middle School is. There's a monument there. World discovery of natural gas. First industrial use of natural gas was at that site by William Tompkins, who was married to the aunt of Grant, uh, General Grant. If you remember, she had the famous letter to give the Union soldiers, you know, don't burn down this house because this is my aunt. And she is the and she was the ancestor of Mary Lee Seven and, the, uh, and, and her her father. Uh, the uh, but all the buildings are James really started in the 1970s uh, uh, and then the Canal Valley Historic, Historical Historical and Preservation Society got organized and, 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 and saving those buildings. They were not able to save Amanda Johnson's house. It was a rubble. It was really a fall down when James came and the Historic Society started working. So they took the brick, and the bricks you see at the park are from uh, Anna Amanda's house. And I say Anna Amanda because that's what most <coughs> people called her. Her mother was best friends with Amanda Johnson. Her grandmother had been enslaved. Uh, her mother and father were married in the Kanawha Valley Saint in the Kanawha Salem's Baptist Church because it was bigger. Interesting, Lewis Harlan says in the marriage records in Kanawha County that Booker T. Washington was married in the African Zion Baptist Church. They don't say that. And, I, and what's interesting is the witness of the person who reports it is the man who, who owned uh, I'm going to go on, who owned the same house that the doctor lived in that was the man's. But I cannot find anything to show in the Canal Valley in the Canal Savings <coughs> church records. I asked them, they, they don't know uh, whether or not Booker was actually married uh, in that church or in the African Zion. Mrs. Cooper was married in the, the Canal Savings Church. And she said, well, my mother and father were. In 1880 or whatever, because it was a bigger church. 
She was quite a lady. She helped integrate the North County School. She was a second grade teacher. When she talked, she did everything discreetly. She didn't say when the steamboats came to the town, everybody would run down. She would say there would be boys and they had those long coats. They'd be flapping in the wind and everybody was so excited. What a great teacher. My, my brother-in-law was taught by her in the second grade about a year. And she, uh, uh, she recounted, she said, and, and, and I said, this is good work. This is in that little book. I said, you know, what was it like in segregation days? I mean, what, how were you treated? And she was an elegant lady, truly elegant lady. And she had these long hands. So some people wonder why I was so impressed with that. But she, she took her hand and she said, I never heard the N word. Do you know, do you know that word, Mr. Rose? Very proper. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I never heard that in <coughs> she said, I never was treated with anything but respect, ever. And I said, well, what was it like, you know, in segregation? I said, because you couldn't go to the same thing. We were segregated on a number of things. She said, oh, but it worked out fine. I went to Columbia. I went to, uh, well, before she got her four-year degree out of state. And then, uh, because there was no master's program here, West Virginia would pay the tuition out of state for any African American who wanted to go to college. So she got to go to Columbia and different places. And she said, I would go to New York in the month of August when all my friends, they were waiters and different folks in the movie, I mean, in the theater industry, they would go to the beach and we would have, my husband and I would have their house. And she said, I saw the last game played by the Brooklyn Dollars. I said, really, this is good. She said, oh, yes. And she said, oh, she said, I've had a romantic <laughs> I just want, I want to do that. I had a romantic life. She said, there was, there was rooftop dancing. And I, she said, I went to the Starlight Club. I said, what about the Apollo? Oh, yes, we did all those things. And I had a romantic life. And of course, the, the Cole sisters knew Mrs. Cooper growing up, and she was, she was older than they were. But they said that she taught Latin to the, to the, to the well-to-do kids. What they would do is they would, they would go, they would form, they would go right where her house is, right behind the church, and take a ferry across who had a ferry across, and then they would take the train from basically where Kanawha City is in Kanawha City. Uh, I mean, Kmart is in Kanawha City. And take the train into town, and she would teach them Latin as they would go in. When they got off the train, she would go to, uh, I don't know, I guess Garn, whatever the school was that she went to, and the white kids would go to a different school. And to her, that was, was the problem. I was never treated with anything but respect. My, my uncle was in the same study, Dave Latt. Well, yes, and, and, and they're both, you know, and he's a photographer in uh, Washington, yeah. and a very successful photographer. I will tell him about the night. Oh, very good, very good. Well, he just wanted to turn a lot of it. I've met with him a number of times in all. Uh, but, it, you know, it's just, a, it's just a, a wonderful history, and you say, well, how do you get infected with this? It was really Mrs. Cooper, but I have to go back. I'm wearing my little gold. I have to go back to my mother, my grandmother because she, she thought it was important and she helped me put the scrapbook together when I was in fifth grade. In those days, you had five, four years of West Virginia. We had fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Not anymore. In fact, do you know, can I, uh, do you realize that West Virginia history is not taught in, in high school? How? What? It's not on, there are 70 some clubs in Capitol High School. You can't take West Virginia history. Or any of the schools in Columbia. Now I have to say my son got elected, which is kind of interesting, at age 14 to the board of directors of Canaan uh, Historic and Present Historical and Preservation Society. And he said, What I'd like to do is to is to require have the school board require the West Virginia history to talk in high school. I thought, now that 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 gets us going. And it should be. Uh, and any other questions? As you can guess, I can go one more. I, and I would like you to ask questions of the group rather than maybe just afterwards if you've got some questions. Don't be shy. Yes, sir. Okay, the, the name right before really would have been Saltboro. Canal Salines kind of carry through, and, and of course, Salines being the salt. Uh, 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 names were sort of casual at the time. Charleston's post office now was Charleston Courthouse until I think the 1870s. They didn't change it to the name of Charleston. So names were kind of casual in those days. Were, Malden was incorporated as Malden for two years. And they had a constable who was murdered right, right on the two block from my house. He was murdered. And the fellow was, was sentenced to hang. It was appealed. And he, he, and he 
eventually he wasn't hanging and the town decided to unincorporate. So they eliminated the, the incorporation. Was Canal City, that area you were talking about, was that the South Mall that worked out? The, it, the South Mall is, is, is Canal Right. Is, 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 is what we call it. It was the, the ferry. East Canal States. East Canal States of South Mall. Yeah. Anyway? Now I'm talking now I'm talking about what Roosevelt Avenue is and the, the yeah. Galaxy Bowling Lane. That's what's straight across from the mall. Where Kmart. Yeah, Kmart in that area. That's that would be. And of course the train came through there. Another interesting fact about Washington, Ferguson is just no fool. If you look at when the railroad comes through, it goes right through next to his property. And the uh, and he got about two or three times the amount of payment taking of his property from the railroad than all of his neighbors. I can't tell you exactly, but he got almost as much from the railroad as what he paid for the property. Yes? <laughs> about as pastoral and lovely as it could ever be, but that's also the site of the very last salt operation in the Canal Valley. They had a bromide plant there, and, and the, it, it, it sort of exploded in 1985, and they decided to shut it down because of concerns over safety. But that is the last salt production place. Now Terrastalis is, is there in Ter Terracare, but the house that's there is, is one of the original old Salt maker homes. I've tried to get photographs of the great salt maker family houses. The Shrewsbury's, I've told you, that house is still there. It's the red brick on the, on the, the Oaks house in Malden uh, uh, on the river. But I thought that the, the house, that the Dickinson house, was, a, was built in 1935. That's what I was told. See, sometimes you get told things that aren't right. And I asked now the children, and they said, I, she said, none of that. She said, the, 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 the chimneys are 200 years old. That what they did in the 1930s was to refurbish and, and reconstruct. And the, the, the Mrs. Ratcree was there for many years, and I did it some Ratcree. And when she passed away, it's my understanding that the, her girls and I had the property, and they're, they're sort of maintaining the farm. Yes. If, if it hadn't been for the salt industry and the Dickinson family, and the banking truly would have been established in Charleston, allow Charleston to grow. It went right at the corner of Capitol Street where all the banks. They depended on Virginia banks until they established their own banks at Charleston. Right. It was one of the, yeah. Um, but we, of course, we go back in time, BB&T was One Valley Bank. Canal was, Valley. Was Canal Valley Bank, and they were Dickinson Banks. And yes, they were, they were very important in that development. You know, lot, lots of lots of important developments there. And, and really, I think there are seven, seven, the seventh generation of Dickinsons are in the Canal Valley. I'm trying to count it up. Let me point out, if you go out to the park, please notice that you were giving us the name, and Strudwick was one we struggled with the most, because it's like, is that S-T-R-U-D-W-I-C? What we did is, is we put a monument up to the to Booker T and to Amanda, but also we listed all of the African-American families we could identify in the 18, in the 1900-1910 census, and Strudwick was one of the names I thought, and it was a handwritten, and it's so hard to figure out. And then somebody said, it's Strudwick. And so we, so we have those names there, Isaac and, and, and all of those. Yeah. And so if you, if you go out, be sure to check out those names. Uh, my grandparents moved from Malden to South Charleston in the 40s. Um, I know my grandfather's family came from uh, southern West Virginia, up into the Canal Valley. My grandmother was a Spriggle, and there are a lot of Spriggles in the mall that still, from what I understand. They go back quite a ways. Yes, to pre, pre Civil War, the Spriggles. I, I want to say he was a butcher. I may, have, it may be wrong, but, but the, the land, you know, if you, we were talking about where Booker's yeah. Cabinet adjoined, the, the Spriggle property adjoined that. And, and if you were to, coming out of Mall and you decide not to go to Bell over the, the cabinet property, if you go and make the circle around, that was all Spriggle property. And the Spriggles were there. We actually don't have any Spriggles there now, at least with that name. But uh, the Spriggles were there when I came uh, uh, about 1995. They were still But I believe one of the family stories is, is that I believe it was when Amanda married, I don't know if it was my grandmother or my great grandmother, was in the wedding party. It could easily have been when she was married. So that's easy.
easily be. Right. Well, and I just remember the name. It was Hubbard that's on the marriage ticket as a witness. It's Hubbard. And it was Mr. Hubbard who owned the, the, uh, the man, bought the manse, and then sold it to the Tenoch Seventh Presbyterian Church, and was married to a different. Yes. Uh, one last thing. I, I've done a lot of research on the phone. So when you talk about the fact that they had been well established to go back to England and different things, is that right? That, that's right. And John John Dickinson got a lot of property in this area. And I don't know that he ever came, but he but, but, but he, because of his work in the Revolutionary War, what happened when you went to war, you got land. Right? That was the that was the gimmick. So so the Dickinsons really are interested here because of salt and all that, and they're sort of late to the party on that. But they still get here by the by the by the eighteen twenties. But uh, yeah, that's that's exactly right. But not the rough ones. Uh, they came from a different part. Right. They they were the worker. They were the working class that industrialized how to make more out of the salt. Right. Well, I don't know if you could say it, but you know, I mean, they bought. They they were able to buy 500. They were from uh, I want to say Lorraine, Virginia, but in the Valley of Virginia, and they were able to buy the 500 acres. Uh, yeah. that, that that is the rough land. And by the way, the rough land, you know, goes from somewhere around close to Ruffin Street, all the way up, and, and where we are right now was, was a farmland for the Ruffers. The house that's here next to the governor's mansion was Daniel Ruffner's home and was a stagecoach stop. Andrew Jackson was the sitting president. He was there, Henry Clay was there. This was the route to the west. And we call it Midland Trail. We've got Alice Heisler this night. She's the head of the Midland Trail City Highway Association. But she would tell you that the Midland Trail is named that because it's really middle America. And if you wanted to go from Washington to the west, this was the way you came. Unless you took a river route, and this was probably the way to do it. Yes, sir, please. Fun fact I heard last week that uh, since you're going to keep some kids for the Quiz Bowl and West Virginia history, uh, the newest federal appeals court judge, and I don't know if the investor, uh, talked about one of her great disappointments was never winning the Golden Horseshoe Award in the eighth grade. <laughs> but now she's one up it because she will be on the test as the first woman from West Virginia on the federal appeals board. That's right. And this is the court right below the United States Supreme Court. And, uh, yeah, and, and Judge and Jackson, I, in fact, a friend, of hers, a friend of hers asked me, and I committed, so we'll do it publicly, that, that she said, I think that we need to make sure that the culture and the history of old folks understand that she should be added to their list of, I think it's now almost 1,800 questions. If you go in and type in Golden Horseshoe, this culture history, type in Golden Horseshoe, and then you go and you find the quiz questions, quiz ball questions. There are almost 1,800, and that's what these kids study. And the team we lost to, the Suncrest, memorized them all. <laughs> and I said to my guys, I said, they were just, I mean, they were just surprised. I said, look, there's no way we could win. They said that they didn't miss a question. I said, you can't beat that. It's okay. But uh, yeah, I, and so we hope that, 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 that she will be added to that. So. I will get the information while I'm tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sort of watch that. It, it's in it's in April. Uh, the Golden Horseshoe's test is in early April, and then the, the, the History Bowl's in, in late April. They have cash prizes. The kids, I think, interesting things happen. We had two kids who were really schooled in history, and they kind of carried us. And, and one, one of the kids knew this question <coughs> got us a tie, which ultimately got us into the final on this question. Uh, this Boone County native had a British television documentary made about his unusual dancing skills. <laughs> <laughs> Jesco White. That got us in the pot. That got us in the pot. The only question that, that she, it had to be my daughter, the only question that, that she got as a buzz in in the entire state tournament, Jesco White. She said, afterwards, that she said, you know, you know that we tied because I got Jesco White. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I, was, I didn't know what was going on, but that, you know, so it interesting things. And uh, uh, so it's just that kind of thing. It's a lot of fun. It's really good for the kids. And if you know any seventh or eighth graders, get them ready. Uh, we think it's a good program. Any, any, anybody else? Well, let's give Larry a hand. <laughs> Tuesday every month. Um, next month is
is a little shaky right now. Um, the person that was going to do it moved to Boston. <laughs> me. So be checking your email. If you're not on our email list, stop up and see me and we'll add you. We do the, the shout out once a month. So. Uh, <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 